Well, welcome to our Women's Advent Breakfast. Uh, wonderful that you've joined us. You know, I, I, I enjoy a lot of things here at St. Pius that we do, but one of the things I really enjoy is our Advent and Lenten breakfasts. And, uh, you know, the, traditionally we're always down at Wolford's Roost, but uh, of course with COVID we can't do that. But we want to keep this up and keep it alive, and so we're going to do a virtual one here today, and, and I think you're going to enjoy it. I'm really grateful to Kate Byrne. She's going to be our MC here today, and Rebecca Ricuti is going to be kind of sharing her faith story in terms of, you know, that whole idea of where faith and life interact and they intersect. And I think it's important that we, we can learn a lot from each other when we hear each other's faith stories. So I think you're going to enjoy that very much. And so I'm going to turn it over to, uh, to Kate Burns for, uh, to introduce our speaker. Thank you, Father Walsh. Father Walsh has encouraged us all to seek out and recognize the positive in our lives, especially during these uncertain times. And today is just one example of the fact that however virtual or remote, however present or absent the food may be before you, we're still able to join together as a community, sharing faith, sharing friendship, during this year's Women's Advent Breakfast Program. Again, my name is Kate Burns, and it's an honor to be back with you and to introduce this year's speaker. Rebecca Ricuti is married to her husband, Jeff, and they live in Latham with their three-and-a-half-year-old son, Anthony, a proud St. Pius X Bulldog in pre-K-3. Rebecca graduated from nursing school from Russell Sage College in 2011 and went on to work as a pediatric nurse at Albany Medical Center. She currently works full-time from home with an insurance company as a nurse case manager specializing in pediatric oncology. Rebecca and her family joined St. Pius X in 2016 and have been active leaders and ministers in various capacities. Rebecca serves as a lector. She has organized blood pressure clinics and she's participated in the first pre-Cana retreat to support engaged couples preparing for the sacrament of marriage. Rebecca says that when life wavers, faith carries me. And she's here today to share with us how her journey alongside the seven sacraments has helped her to do just that. Please join me in welcoming this year's Women's Advent Speaker, Rebecca Ricuti. Hello, everyone. I wish we were all gathered together enjoying a tasty breakfast, but I'm happy that I still have the opportunity to share this talk with you all in a safe and effective way. Thank you so much for all of the love, support, and prayers that you've offered me in this time of preparation. Thank you to Father Walsh and your staff for trusting me to be here, for my family who encouraged me to say yes, and to each of you for tu tuning in. I'm really excited to be sharing this time with you. Our parish is full of strong, courageous, and faithful women whom I admire so much, and it is a great honor to have been given this opportunity. In preparation for this talk, I found myself coming back to the same question over and over. Why am I a Roman Catholic? I think the simple answer is that I was raised Catholic. Both my mom and dad's parents were Catholic, my mom played in Holy Spirit Church as a kid while my grandmother washed and ironed the church linens, and my grandpa got down on his knees and prayed every night before bed. They didn't have a lot, but they had God, they had love, and they had family, and I often find myself praying for a life as simple as that seems. My dad's early childhood education days were in Catholic school, he served as an altar boy and often talks of Father Lefevre and his influence in his life. My dad's mom didn't drive except to Price Chopper and to Sunday Mass. And if it happened to be a weekend that she was staying at our home, it was always to Sacred Heart Church in Castleton, and it seemed like we always got lost on the way there. <laughs> Unfortunately, all of my grandparents were called home to God before I even finished middle school. 
I often find myself longing to speak with them about life, faith, suffering, raising a family, and marriage. My dad's mom was a young widow that held her faith and devotion to her husband for decades on this earth without him. And my mom's parents, with very little money, six children, spouses and children overseas at war, cancer, Alzheimer's disease, you name it, they faced it. In spite of it all, their hearts were always filled with the grace of God. Our grandparents laid a strong foundation in faith, and so I imagine that that's the reason my parents raised us Catholic, so I was just always Catholic. I started wondering what's the difference in our faith and other churches. Other Protestant churches are the mega churches that you see and hear about. We're all Christian, right? I never really gave it any thought or took the time to question or understand. I just assumed it was different and other people do that. Some of my dearest friends and family members are part of these other denominations of Christianity. Um, and so I've just always wondered, you know, what's it all about? They're good people whom I love. Some of them used to be Catholic and now they found homes in other places. They speak of Jesus and their faith with such conviction. One of my favorite celebrities happens to be Candace Cameron Bure. I don't know if we have any Full House fans watching. <laughs> um, she reads the Bible verses several times a week on her Instagram. She leads a life of dignity and honor. She serves God first with her family a close second, but she isn't Catholic either. She's a Christian. Why am I Roman Catholic? What was the changing point in the pivotal years when I could have continued to let my lukewarm faith fizzle out and where I am today with this burning passion for God and faith in my heart? As I sat in the chapel experience ador experiencing adoration for the first time after our pre keener retreat last winter, it hit me. It's the seven sacraments of our faith and how we celebrate them as Roman Catholics. It was in learning and studying and truly understanding our sacraments that my faith flourished. This is what I've decided to talk to you all about today. The gift of the seven sacraments of our Catholic faith and how they've shaped my life. The word sacrament is defined as a religious ceremony or rite of passage that is regarded as imparting divine grace and blessings upon those who receive it. Now, I don't know about all of you, but I know that I could use all of the grace that I can get. I'm not talking to you all today because I live a perfect life. Far from it. <laughs> you can often hear me saying that I'm riding the hot mess express, or one of my favorite mottos in motherhood, fake it till you make it. I work full-time from home for an insurance company as a registered nurse case manager for the past three years after the first seven years of my nursing career in the field of pediatrics and pediatric oncology. Through May, I was also teaching nursing students on Saturdays, both in the hospital and then virtually, while I completed my master's degree in nursing education. If you've ever been to 10 a.m. mass, I'm sure you're familiar with my rambunctious three-and-a-half-year-old. How I look today is not how you will see me in mass. I'm usually a bit disheveled, relying on dry shampoo, cleaning up spilled snacks, or pleading with Anthony not to belt out the alleluia during the consecration when he realizes that he's missed it. Now that he's out of practice from so many missed weeks at mass during the pandemic, we have a lot of retraining to do. The point that I make is that I embark on this crazy, wonderful life of being a nurse, wife, mom, daughter, sister, friend, aunt, and mentor, I need all of the grace I can get. And what better way to receive the grace of God than through the sacraments? In our Roman Catholic faith, we have seven sacraments afforded to us. As women, we have six. However, I could argue that the seventh sacrament is just as important in our lives. Baptism is the first of three sacraments of initiation. In baptism, we welcome God into our soul to erase original sin and are invited to live a holy life in order to join God in eternal life. My mom shared that our grandmothers really wanted us baptized within the first month of life when my sister and I were born. 
She and my dad honored that for my sister and I's baptism. And although our grandparents have all since passed, when we were expecting our son Anthony, we decided that we would also like to honor that tradition and have Anthony baptized within the first month of his life. Father Walsh baptized him, and he told us that baptism was the greatest gift that we could give our child, and that is something that I have never forgotten. The reason that we joined St. Pius X Parish was so that our son would grow up in a parish where he could complete all of his sacraments, attend school, and really just grow to be a part of it. At baptism, Father gave Anthony the seed of faith, and we were chosen by God to be Anthony's parents and foster and grow that faith. As parents, it's hard to know if you're doing a good job in every regard. Education, child care, nutrition, activity levels, screen time, quality time, sleep. Throw in a global pandemic and any amount of confidence in my parenting that I thought I was holding on to was out the window. We question ourselves every step of the way. Yet every now and then, something will happen that will make you say, hey, maybe we're doing better than we thought. I think that these moments are gifts from God. St. Pius feels like home for our family. We've attended Mass regularly as a family since we were expecting our son here at this parish and have been coming every day since Anthony, or every week since Anthony was, I think, four days old. On one particular blessing of the stuffed animals last year, Anthony went to the altar for the blessing. I was concerned about candles getting knocked over when the blessing was over, so I ushered Anthony back to his dad and turned towards the flames. Well, Anthony was gone, just like that. Par the parish was going to be dismissing in only five minutes, and he was absolutely nowhere to be found. After what was probably just five seconds, all of Anthony's usher friends sprung into action and were on alert looking for him. After what was probably only 45 seconds, but of course felt like a lifetime, I noticed across the altar that Anthony was walking hand in hand with parish trustee Cindy Pettit back towards us. We later realized that he went back to the mirror image location of where we had been sitting, hopped up in the pew, and just sat down with another family. Thank God Cindy saw him walk by and then also saw us on the other side of the altar looking panicked. Later on, we shared this story with a friend, and he told us about Jesus at the temple. Jesus, Mary, and Joseph traveled to Jerusalem to celebrate the feast of the Passover. After the feast, Mary and Joseph began their journey home, and after a day's travel, they realized that Jesus, who was 12 at the time, was not with them. He had stayed behind in Jerusalem, soaking in all that he could from those in the temple. It took his parents three days to find him. When they did find him, Jesus questioned his parents for worrying, stated, Did you not know I was in my father's house? The gift that we've given to Anthony in baptism is growing, and we are forever grateful. St. Pius is truly his father's house. Another sacrament that we are able to receive is the sacrament of reconciliation. In reconciliation, God invites us to confess our sins to a priest and seek repentance. Through God's grace, the faithful are absolved of their sins and reconciled within the Catholic community. Jesus died on the cross to save us from our sins. What exactly does that mean? The fact that God sent his only son to be born as a baby with Mary and Joseph as his parents, live a sinless life, and then die on the cross to later rise again, provides us with the gift of repentance and eternal life in his kingdom. The cross that Jesus bore was the weight of our sins. I don't know about all of you, but when I received my first reconciliation at first or second grade, I definitely did not understand that. I imagine that when I sat down with Father Krupa, Way back then, I probably confessed to fighting with my sister, because what else do you really confess when you're that young? As I've grown older and really learned the meaning of reconciliation, I understand that it's one of God's great gifts to us. I admit that I don't attend confession nearly as often as I should. I think that God's grace invites us to constantly improve and strive to do better. It's in moments like these that we can look inward and see areas of our life to improve upon. For me, it's definitely more frequent confession.
When you commit a sin and seek God's forgiveness from a source of faith and repentance, he takes it from us. That's it. Through his grace, we are forgiven, and we no longer need to revisit that sin. Attending reconciliation with my then-fiancé was a great part of our marriage prep. The Advent season is another great time for confession as we prepare for the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And Father Walsh has a lot of opportunities for confessions during this season, if you're interested. Another sacrament is the sacrament of the Holy Eucharist, also known as Holy Communion. Through communion, we are invited to receive the body of Christ in soul and divinity. At the Last Supper, Jesus broke bread and offered himself to us. The sacrament of the Eucharist is the one that we can receive most frequently throughout our lives. Reflecting back on my own First Communion, I don't have a lot of memory of it. I know there's a great photo of me with my grandma and grandpa, which I love. I think that it's fitting that of my First Communion, that is the photo and the memory that still remains, as they were the center of our faith life as the whole Shannon family at large. I love attending weekly Mass and joining in the Eucharist with our St. Pius X family. The idea that there's a vast community of Catholics all over the world to attend Mass, hear the same readings, and witness the same consecration to receive the body and blood of Jesus is really incredible when you stop to think about it. My other favorite celebration of the Eucharist was at our wedding. Knowing that Jesus was there and sharing in that sacrament with our closest family and friends was such a gift. As a mother, I think of the sacrifice Mary made so that we could receive the Eucharist. She agreed to carry and birth this child, raised him to live a life free of sin, full of grace, divinity, and service. And then she had to watch him carry his cross, be subjected to abuse and torture, and ultimately die before her eyes. I think about Mary a lot and her role in the sacraments. I really find her present in the Eucharist. As a mother who's growing more in her faith every day, I constantly think of the Holy Family. After I receive communion, one of my consistent prayers is one of gratitude to not only God, but also to Mary for the gift of sacrificing their son. I never really fully understood the implication of that until I became a mom. I mentioned earlier that I just experienced my first ever adoration. We went into the chapel and the Eucharist was placed before us in the monstrance. We just sat there in the company of Jesus. It was by far one of the most sacred experiences that I've ever had, and I invite you to do so if you haven't or it's been a while. On a simpler level, I find that with regular receipt of the Holy Eucharist, I find it much easier to let go and let God. Receiving the Eucharist is cleansing to the soul and invites us to grow in likeness with Jesus. Throughout the pandemic, Father Walsh tried Father Walsh challenged us to try and find the positive side of things. A newfound appreciation for the Eucharist and accessibility to our home here at St. Pius is something that I gained from the pandemic. They say that absence makes the heart grow fonder, and I couldn't agree more that this is something learned in these times. I remember the first few weeks back in the pews after so long away, and there was so much emotion that it was palpable. I pray that when this pandemic is long behind us, and it will be, (laughs) that we will remember that emotion and hold on to that gratitude. I really invite you all to learn about the Eucharist and attend a period of adoration. Be with Jesus and reflect on what the Eucharist means in your life and how you can open yourself to receive it more fully. Our next sacrament, if we were to follow the traditional order of things, is confirmation. Confirmation perfects our baptism and brings us the graces of the Holy Spirit that were granted to the apostles on Pentecost Sunday. In a teenager's eyes, it might be the time that their parents finally get off their back and let them be in charge of whether or not they will be regular participants in their faith. Confirmation for me was not only a pivotal time in my faith, but it was also a pivotal time in my life. My parents were divorced when I was in second grade. Following that, my mom had full custody, and she and my eventual stepdad gave us a great life. My dad was also remarried, and when I was in seventh grade, I felt that living with my dad and stepmom was best for me. Because of my age and my wishes, my dad was granted full custody. 
I spent about three or four years living with them. I enjoyed my time with them and was happy to be living in their home. But as time passed, it got increasingly harder. I think that as I aged, I needed to be with my mom. They did the best they could blending a family, but with the adjustment and varying personalities, it was just challenging for me personally. God walks with us in every stage of life, no matter what, and throughout these years, I know that God was working on me. He has a reason for everything, and I feel with certainty that he was working on me through my stepmom's mom. I grew so close with her that she was just Grammy. She had such a strong faith in God, and she provided for me what my mom and dad's parents couldn't since they had passed away when I was so young. She taught me how to pray the rosary. We sat with them at church most Sundays, and I even had the opportunity to attend daily mass with her and Pop several days a week before school. If you went to her house for a party, you would have no clue who was family and who were just friends. Everybody was just in the family category with Grammy. She was also a pediatric nurse in her career, and I so wish that I could just have had one day with her to talk shop after becoming a pediatric nurse myself. Grammy lost her father at a very young age. She then lost her brother, her sister, and her brother-in-law. She and Pop raised her nieces, and she became mom number two for them in their teen years. She had breast cancer at a young age, and then it recurred later to her bones. She never lost her faith, as far as I could tell. Toward the end of Grammy's battle with metastatic breast cancer, Pop would go to daily mass while Grammy watched daily mass at home, and he would come home with communion just in time for the EWTN communion service. Grammy was a rock of faith for me during those years of my life. It was during my junior year of high school that I decided I wanted to move back home with my mother. The struggles were beginning to impact my faith because I started to feel conflicted with what attending mass regularly meant. I started to think that you could be a good person, a faithful person without church and the image that attending mass regularly created. This was obviously before I understood the Eucharist and what it meant to receive it regularly. I made the decision to return home to my mom's house, and it just so happened to be the week of my confirmation. My mom welcomed me home and got me to confirmation. We got into our groove again. We started attending Mass together regularly, and I was feeling at home. Although I received my confirmation at Sacred Heart, Holy Spirit soon became an integral, integral part of my life, and I think perhaps my mom started taking me to Mass again because of my confirmation and also because she knew I needed it. I think we both did. I didn't really get what confirmation was at that stage of my life, but I'm so happy that I had the support of my mom and my Grammy to have received my confirmation and my final sacrament of initiation. Following confirmation, I felt at home again. However, just a year later, I went off to college away from home. Looking back on that time, I was in a vulnerable state and was certainly not ready to be away from home. I fell into the college life and found myself strayed from faith again. I would attend Mass in Oneana here and there, and I would go with my mom when I was home for the weekend, but it was never with regularity, and the life that I was living outside of church certainly did not align with my values and definitely did not make God proud. Luckily for me, he has already saved us. He is always ready to welcome us home to his kingdom. I think of just how many times I strayed and how badly I did, and then I look at my life today, and all I can think is thank you, God, for your unconditional love. Thank you for the people that you placed in my life throughout all of the years that never allowed me to run away from my faith fully, and thank you for sending me my husband when I needed him most. I was going to talk about the sacrament of marriage now as I follow this traditional timeline, but I've decided to save the best for last. <laughs> So, on to the Sacrament of Holy Orders. This sacrament extends to us the continuation of Christ's priesthood that he initially bestowed upon his apostles. Ordination to the priesthood, diaconate, or as a bishop offers men the vocation of holy life. While I will never directly receive the Sacrament of Holy Orders, it's one that has a great impact on my life. I never know what the future could bring, but perhaps I could be a priest's mother or maybe a deacon's wife. One thing I do know for certain is the impact that priests have had on my life to this day. 
The impact of the priesthood is something I will also visit in the next sacrament. But first, my childhood priest, Father Tom Krupa. He was the absolute best. I never thought I'd ever be able to love another priest the way that we loved him. But thank God for Father Walsh, literally. <laughs> Father Krupa always left an appeal, appeal and desire for more in our faith, even when I was in the lukewarm phases. After any Sunday in one of his pews, I was left wanting more, and I believe that he's the reason that I never permanently left the faith. Our friend, Father Jay Atherton, who married us, has become a part of our family. He helped us with premarital counseling and still continues to be a constant part of our life and family. He sends us varying, various resources or uplifting content to support our life and marriage and parenthood, and he is always there for us. Father Leo Marker is like an extra grandfather in our son's life and ours, always spreading Jesus' love, support, and prayer over our life and family. Father Walsh has been there for my husband since he was school-aged at St. Thomas and throughout his entire life. He's been there for me since we were married, expecting our first child, and now through day-to-day -day life today. I'm so happy that he will have the same impact on my son that he's had on my husband. There are many priests in our life that I don't know what we would do without them. Most recently, Father Moret joined the ranks of impactful priests in my life, and I don't know how I would have made it through the past year without him. The sacrament of holy orders is so important to each of us, even as women, and it is important that we continue to pray for vocations to holy life and to pray for the men that are currently in formation. The next sacrament is the anointing of the sick. A member of the Catholic faith could receive the sacrament for anointing of the sick several times throughout their life. It's a special anointing to give strength and comfort to the ill and align their suffering with Jesus during his passion. When at the point of death, the priest can offer a special apostolic blessing known as last rites. As I align this sacrament with my life, I find that I naturally placed it towards the end because my experience it is an end-of-life care and I think of last rites more often than I think of anointing of the sick. Death is a part of life, one of the only true guarantees in fact. However, it can bring out some very challenging emotions and feelings and how we align them with our faith will have an impact on how we're able to move past death. At almost 32 years old, I would be willing to bet that I have been to more wakes and funerals than some people twice my age. This is not a trophy that I display proudly, but it is certainly something that has shaped my life and my faith. I mentioned earlier that I was a pediatric oncology nurse for the first seven years of my nursing career. By the time I reached high school, I had already seen three grandparents go to heaven. During college is when I lost my Grammy. And in the past 10 years since becoming a pediatric oncology nurse, I've seen far too many children cross over to heaven. My journey has been tumultuous to say the least. I went from faith in God to questioning everything my faith stood for to finding my way home to God with a deep understanding of suffering and the role that it plays in our faith. It took me 10 years of that career and exposure to find God's grace in suffering. Throughout the years, I did always notice that the families that had faith or a more spiritual take on things grieved better. The kids and their parents had less fear and a certain level of peace. One of my patients told her priest during one of their final visits that she was excited to go to heaven and see Jesus. It still gives me goosebumps to think about that today. The families that didn't have faith or spirituality were often lost, angry, broken, or divided. I had a hard time understanding how they could go on and how they could face death without faith. Father Walsh once told me that their faith didn't matter, that my faith would carry them through, and that definitely helped me survive those experiences. I always attended wake services for patients that I felt close to. However, there were a handful of patients whom I also attended their funeral. After each funeral service, I would feel this greater peace. God gives us grace even in times of great pain. The wonderful men he has called to serve as priests give us a great gift in helping us understand our grief and cope with it. Yesterday was my dear friend's birthday. 
She would have turned 23, however, was called home to God just after her 22nd birthday on December 17th of last year. I will never forget sitting at her funeral on December 23rd. I was so sad and devastated that Christmas trees could have a place on the altar at a funeral. It was so unnatural to me, awaiting the birth of Jesus and celebrating a funeral mass. I was so sad and hurt, but I can proudly say that for the first time in those 10 years, I ran to my faith. Father Moret, who set her funeral, did not dance around the hard topics like pain and suffering. Somehow, he made it all make sense. I had an image of my friend and her mom celebrating Christmas together in heaven for the first time since she was eight. I learned that Father Moret had made it to the hospital before she passed to be able to give her her last rites. And I truly felt like I had an alleluia in my heart, just as Father Moret had called us to do at the end of his homily. She was home. She is home. <laughs> She is free of pain and suffering and uncertainty for the first time in six years of battling leukemia. It would be very selfish of me to wish that she were still here, even though I do quite often. <laughs> I still miss her every single day. I wrote a letter to Father Moret after her funeral services, thanking him for his homily and service to her family and to us. And he sent me a heartfelt letter and some resources on suffering in reply. That time and energy that he devoted to me is something that I will never forget. He taught me about suffering, our faith, and end of life after it, after it had been a large part of my life for 10 years. His connection to both her family and mine is what was able to make that difference for me, I believe. My heart breaks for her family that has been through so much pain and loss, but I remember our God. I look forward to being reunited with her in heaven, and I thank him for the six years that I did have her, as a patient first, then a best friend, and ultimately a member of our family. Everything happens in, God plan, in God's plan, and it isn't my right to get it every single time. So until he shows me the why, I will be happy for the time that I had with each and every one of these amazing souls and their family. I thank him for the grace that he gives us with the sacraments and the peace that is afforded to us in knowing that our loved ones have received last rites. Okay, so my husband and better half said that we have to end on a high note. So last but not least, my most favorite sacrament. The sacrament of marriage is another of God's great gifts of grace. In marriage, man and woman are joined in a sacred union in order to ensure the right of procreative power. Husband and wife are joined as one in soul and divinity, and the goal is to spend their earthly life together, fostering each other and growing so that their souls can get to heaven after this life. I met my husband in the spring of 2012. We began dating and our relationship grew on a foundation of shared faith, desired career and educational goals, and a desire for family. My faith at that time was not in a good place. I had been working as a pediatric oncology nurse for just about one year at that time, and quite honestly, I was still a child myself. I was not adequately coping with the loss and suffering of all these children. You all know the thought, how could any God allow this to happen? I decided that I really liked this guy. Faith was important to him, it was important to me, too, and I decided I could either spend my time figuring it all out by continuing to avoid it or by starting to attend Mass regularly. This is really when my understanding of the sacraments began, with a deeper understanding of marriage. I realized after attending regular Mass with Jeff and many deep conversations the work that God does on our soul the role of your significant other in a relationship, and the deeper meaning and value of our faith. I learned that previously, after all of these years, I was just kind of this surface-level Catholic who went to Mass and celebrated the holidays. I had all of these role models of faith, but it was my boyfriend who made me realize the difference in where I was with my faith and where I desired to be in my faith and devoting my life to God. It was when I learned about marriage as a vocation. Jeff and I will be celebrating our fifth wedding anniversary in May. 
I think the most important thing that has come from our marriage is our son, Anthony. And surprise, a new baby girl coming around Memorial Day. I was told since I was around 17 that conception would not come easy for me. It was something that Jeff and I discussed in great depth and talked about in our premarital counseling with our priest that married us. Having a family was really important to us, and what could the risk of infertility do? We fully trusted in God's plan for what our future family would look like. I was pretty confident that we would enjoy a few years of marriage before attempting to start a family, but had settled on the fact that it might not ever happen for us. Well, we quickly learned that God's plan for us and science did not agree. We were blessed with Anthony Thomas just nine months and 15 days after our wedding. We foster our marriage with regular participation in our faith. We have daily prayer practices as a family. We attend Mass regularly. We receive the Sacrament of Reconciliation together, and we participate in many ministries within our parish, both together and individually. Marriage is not always easy, but it is always worth it. And with God at the center of our marriage, we know that there's no obstacle too large. While motherhood isn't a sacrament, in my life it's truly a calling from God. The sacrament of marriage gives us the gift of being a parent, and the vocation of wife and mom are the biggest gift that God has given me. I thank him every day for his grace that comes with both. Thank you so much for walking with me along the journey of my faith life as I weaved it into the sacraments. I really hope that you were able to learn something this morning, and I appreciate your time and attention. As we walk through Advent, maybe think about what your favorite sacrament is and find a way to celebrate it in a special way. I love the sacrament of marriage and my vocation as a wife and mom, and of course I love the Eucharist. I look forward to growing in faith with you all during this wonderfully messy, grace-filled life from our wonderful God. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca, for your courage and your willingness to share your story of faith and how it's been inspired by the seven sacraments. It's days like today that remind us all of our call to grow in faith together during what you said so well, this wonderfully messy, grace-filled life from our wonderful God. Just a few brief announcements before we close in prayer. Well, friends, if you enjoyed your experience today, we invite you to mark your calendars for Saturday, March 6th, for our Lenten breakfast for both men and women scheduled at the Wolfert's Roost. If we're unable to be there in person at that time, we'll be holding another virtual offering like the one today. We hope you'll all come back, bring your friends, family, and loved ones to join in. COVID cannot take away our celebration of Christ at Christmas, but things will look different this year. We'll have a reservation system starting in mid-December on the St. Pius X website. Masses will be held on Christmas Eve at 1 p.m., 4.30 p.m., and 8 o'clock p.m., and we'll celebrate on Christmas morning at 10 a.m. A mailing is going out this week and will include this schedule with details about a drive-through communion procession. So please be sure to look for ongoing communication through our Tuesday updates, our Thursday constant contact, and of course weekend announcements. And finally, as we move towards our second Sunday of Advent, we hope that the spirit of the season leads you deeper into a time of prayerful reflection. Our next Advent program will be on Sunday, December 20th, from 11 to 12 in the Parish Circle. For many of you involved in the food collection that was part of your Advent box, this is the date when you can drive by and return those food items in your bag. There will be exciting festivities as you drive by, including a visit from Santa. So thank you all again for joining us. A special thank you to Neil Johanning and to the competent and compassionate staff at St. Pius X for supporting this program. And at this time, I'd like to welcome Deacon Marty to lead us in closing prayer.
In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. This is Advent, a season of promise. In our worship, we prepare for the birth of a baby in a dusty stable in Bethlehem and remind ourselves that this child will become the savior of the world who will return again in power and glory to draw all of his children together with songs of everlasting praise. The promise of this baby is also the promise of eternal life to all who believe. God of hope and promise, be with us throughout this Advent season and draw us ever closer as we journey together toward the stable and the birth of your Son, our Savior. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and thank you for joining us.